How do you define story? A story transports me to a different place, to a different world, to um, a, a world and a life and meeting new characters that immerse me in an entirely new experience. You know, I think about some of the early storytellers in my life, like my grandmother, um, who was a oral storyteller. And she would tell us stories uh, when we were kids about her life and, um, you know, how she met her husband, stories of our youth when we were children. So I like to think of story as, you know, there are stories that are nostalgic with a beginning, middle, and an end. But when I think about stories in general, they're really a really great um, format, medium, no matter what kind of medium it is, a place to be transported into a world and characters that you might not know. It's a, it's a way for you to um, walk in someone else's shoes, to have empathy for another character, and to see someone else's life through their eyes. Uh, I, I think that that's extremely important for us as human beings and living in the society that we live in today, to be able to hear other people's stories through their own voices, through their unique perspectives, to really appreciate, understand, empathize with how they see the world. Um, so, I don't know, that's a roundabout answer, but uh, story transports you. What is immersive storytelling? Immersive storytelling, there's many various definitions for this, but in my mind, it's using tools and techniques to immerse a guest, a participant, an audience member into an immersive world where they use all of their senses in order to immerse themselves in a particular world or story. And, you know, uh, when I think about immersive storytelling, some of the most successful ones out there they are the ones that really think about not just the visual or the um, you know, uh, audio storytelling, but in what you touch and taste and feel um, and, and really have that interaction between different, perhaps different people or different um, elements or objects that maybe you can pick up, that you can you know, explore and discover and to really feel like you're immersed in a world or an environment that you may not necessarily be familiar with, but you have that suspension of disbelief to allow the storyteller, the creator, to take you there, to really immerse you in that uh, place to play, to have permission to engage and immerse yourself in something that you wouldn't normally in your regular lives. So to be immersed in that story and feeling like you're a part of it, feeling like that you're an important part of it is extremely important, I think, too. Um, that you're not just a spectator, that you are an engaged, active participant in that story. So there are different kinds of immersive storytelling, ones where you do come into a space and it's extremely visual and there's music and all of that, but you walk around like you're perhaps a ghost or you don't have any effect to the environment. But then there's the more extreme types of immersive storytelling where you are an active participant. You can be a hero to that story and you can really take part in shaping the outcome of that story too. So there's different levels of participation, levels of engagement of what you can do in an immersive storytelling world. Does every place have a story? I think so. I believe that. Every place has a story. This room that we're in has a story. Uh, this house, this town, this city. It's a question of who's telling the story, right? Um, I think that if you asked the person who lived in this house, 50 years ago versus 100 years ago versus 1,000 years ago, right? Um, everyone has a different story to tell, but 
yes, 100%. Every place has a story and every person has a story too. And uh, I, I find that one of the most fascinating things to think about is, you know, if you have that chance to the, tell the story of yourself or the place that you're in, what's the story that you want to share with the world? Margaret, what's your reaction to someone saying entering a story is not just an escape? I think that it's, story is, um, it is definitely a way for us to understand and make sense of the world around us. It's a way for us as children, when we first heard stories, un to understand how, um, what's right and wrong, the you know, the good guys, the bad guys, the heroes, the villains, all of these things, you know, what's acceptable, what's not, um, what's the, what's the right choice to make, what's not. I think that for anyone who hears or tells a story, they come, they tell that story through their personal and unique perspective. And what you pass down from generation to generation is what you hope will live on in terms of how you make sense of the world and also how you're not alone when you hear a story. You realize that there's someone else, whether you're reading a book, watching a movie, experiencing a world, you realize there's someone else in the world who understands exactly how I feel and how I live my life and, you know, how I what I dream of and what I hope to do and what I hope to be one day, because a lot of the stories that we hear or experience, the ones that really, really get into our hearts and our souls are perhaps a way to fulfill a deep seated desire and a wish. That's something we always think about when we, you know, um, create any type of stories. What is, what is, the audience's wish fulfillment. What's their fantasy? And let's really get into the heart of what people not only want and desire, but what they need and what they're lacking in their lives. So telling a story does create that understanding and that, you know, making sense of the world and, you know, finding the, the commonalities between us. And that's something that is really exciting to me. Like some of the best stories um, I've heard or read or experienced may not have anything to do with a, you know, a person that I'm, you know, or a culture or a race or a lifestyle or occupation that I'm familiar with, but because there's so many common universal truths to their story, it touches us, you know, it makes us understand, it makes us um, really connect with someone that could be from, you know, living in the other side of the world. But, you know, as a woman, as a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, as a human being, being able to feel that and understand that and make sense of that, that's really magical to have that story really be felt um, with every person that experiences that story. That's really, that's really the, the goal of every storyteller, isn't it? To be able to touch everyone's lives um, in a way that's very meaningful. How is immersive storytelling different from novel writing or screenwriting? Yeah, um, immersive storytelling is extremely different uh, from more traditional forms of storytelling, like novels and um, screenwriting. I think because the role of the writer, the storyteller, is really part of a greater team. This is some. This is not a solitary craft. Um, and you know, I love to read books and I love to watch movies. And it, it's similar with film production too. Uh, I'm. I would hope that, you know, the writer works with the director and with the actors and all of this. But I think the role of the writer and the storyteller in immersive storytelling is extremely um, important in that they are the story champion and the guardian of that 
story craft throughout the, you know, from the beginning of the project to the end, because you have to find ways to be able to embrace and celebrate that story in various disciplines. Um, you know, you talk to the landscape designer, to the architect, to the um, audio engineer, to the, to the graphic designer, in terms of being able to tell one story, one story world, let's say. And it's not experienced in just one medium. There might be some media components in an immersive story world. There might be some, um, you know, graphic uh, elements that you're reading and listening to. But as a whole, it's a very holistic type of storytelling because you are immersing all of your audience members' senses so that every single detail of the first moment uh, a guest, an audience member walks into your experience until the moment they walk out. Every single detail, every single thing they touch and feel and hear and taste is all a part of that greater story. So how do you tell a story or share a story or have your audience member partake in that story in such a way where they feel like they're the hero and the active and an active important part of that story. And that's very different from, you know, um, reading a novel or watching a movie where the reader or the audience member does not take part. They're, they're viewers or observers or readers. They don't have a place in the story. Whereas in immersive storytelling, the um, audience member, the guest is a part of that story. And they are immersed in this world where perhaps they can take action and, you know, do and see it and um, m take action to have consequences in terms of how the story plays out. So they become one of the characters to the story. And that's really a big difference uh, to any other formats of storytelling. How do people respond when you explain that your job is to create an immersive story, that you're an immersive storyteller? <laughs> they usually question it. Uh, a lot of them ask, what is an immersive storyteller? Why do you need a writer uh, to write immersive stories? Uh, what do you do exactly? I think a lot of people wonder and question, but they're usually very fascinated with what that means. And I think that, you know, it's, it's definitely a growing, ever evolving industry and craft. So there's never, there will never be, and I hope they, there never will be a definition to describe what this immersive storyteller and writer does in this, in any project, because it should evolve. Um, I don't think there should be one format or medium to be able to tell an immersive, a really great immersive story. Uh, I think that the creators who really push in terms of like how you would share an immersive story with the world, um, thinking about how they can just break the barriers and really think about how you can tell a story without characters that you meet, you know, live actors. How can you tell a story in an environment where there isn't anyone in the room? Um, that's what we do a lot when we design attractions um, for theme parks is when you think about the queue, you don't meet anyone, but yet you get a, se a strong sense of place. You get a strong sense of the character who may inhabit this place or previously inhabited the place or the person you're about to meet, right? You get, a, you get this very strong sense of placemaking is what we call it in the industry. So there's people often question that. And, you know, I start off by saying, well, my experience and my, what I studied in film school was to be a writer and screenwriter. And I kind of build it up from there. So, you know, I write for um, theme park attractions and rides and shows and museum experiences and really trying to make this very uh, holistic type of um, storytelling world where you can experience a story and a place in very unique and one-of-a-kind ways. Um, 
and at the end of the, at, at, for every project, you know, our goal is always to surprise and delight guests and audience members and visitors so that they can see the world differently, to think about, um, you know, new ways and new approaches to living their own lives based on what they've just experienced, to really hold a mirror to yourself and to reflect on what you've experienced and to reflect on how you can change your life for the better, um, how you can really bring, you know, positivity and unity to your own life and to the world. What is suspension of disbelief? It's a way for you as a storyteller to really immerse someone, make them believe that they are in that world, in that space. And it's a, it's a storytelling, um, I guess, way of explaining how you can really immerse someone in an environment and in a situation where they forget everything else and they can be truly present in, um, in the world that you've created, in the story that you've created. So being able to suspend your audience's disbelief in creating, um, you know, if you're walking into a space that's supposed to look like you're going into a space shuttle, for example, can you suspend your audience's disbelief that for a moment they truly are? And for a lot of the times when an audience or a visitor goes into an experience like this, they are willingly, um, they willingly want to suspend their disbelief because they want to experience something that really transports them into this other world. So uh, as a creator and as a storyteller, how can you best um, have that environment, have that world truly capture their imagination and meet and exceed their expectations of what being in a space shuttle would really feel like, right? And how can you do that with not only the um, environment that you create, but maybe through movement, through murmur, through sound, through scent, uh, through what they feel and touch and hear and, you know, um, experience. I think that that's something as an immersive storyteller you need to think about is how do you suspend your audience's disbelief so that they feel like this is truly where they're walking into and this is truly the world that in their wildest imaginations has come alive and come true for them. What tools can you use to get someone to suspend their disbelief? I think you can use whatever tool is at your disposal. I mean, I remember as a kid going through the Haunted Mansion for the first time in Disneyland and wanting to recreate my own Haunted Mansion in my own, my cousin's actually, bedroom. And you work with whatever you can get. I mean, whatever is around you. You don't have to have a multi-million dollar budget. You can work with um, whatever it is you have at your disposal. At the time, you know, it was just moving around furniture, using makeup to make ourselves look like ghosts, darkening the rooms, having the right music. And a lot of what you do to suspend an audience's disbelief is your Allowing yourself, giving yourself that permission to really open up your imagination and create something unlike anything you've seen before. And I think the ones that are truly uh, game-changing in terms of using tools in unexpected ways or using, um, you know, a different kind of medium to be able to suspend your audience's disbelief, doing it in a surprising way, those are the ones that really speak to me. Those are the ones that really uh, surprise and delight me because it's not like you see you're inspired by something and then replicate it in the exact same way because there's plenty of that going on around in the world, right? How can you create something that has your mark, your personality, your perspective, your tone, um, in a way 
that reshapes, retells that world, that story in a way that's unique and the way that is authentically you. So whether you, you all you have is a basement or a storage unit or, uh, you know, if you do have a whole mansion to play with, you know, I think it really it's up to you as the artist, as the creator, as a storyteller to really uh, think outside the box, uh, to think about how to use any tool at your disposable at your disposal to really create something truly unique. Well, you talk about in your book that um, when you read or watch a movie or even hike, that you're present finally. Because mm -hmm. especially today, we're so distracted. And you talked about the urge to check your phone yes. even when you go in an elevator. We all do that. But that you're truly present when you're in a story mm -hmm. that that or, or even just in an environment, whether it's hiking mm -hmm. or wherever. So uh, maybe that's the real test is how present is the audience mm -hmm. and how can yes. we make them be present Yes. So that they don't have an urge to to pick up the phone or yeah. do something else. Oh yeah, definitely. I think that, and the real test is when you see real emotions, right? When you see, you know, nothing gets me more than seeing, you know, kids kind of like their eyes widen um, because, and children are really one of the best. I. I feel like the the most satisfying audience members for me because when you could see it in their eyes that they believe what they're seeing, that is magic. You know, being able to, you as a creator, storyteller, magician, to conjure up a world in which they believe they're in it and that they're living it is something that all immersive storytellers should really strive for. Um, to really suspend that disbelief and and have them be present and have them forget about everything else, especially with kids who are very screen, um, you know, they would rather the screen among other things, you know, these days. And my nine-year-old son being one of them, um, we want to create that those worlds and environments and places for them to play again. And... You know, there's nothing wrong with playing video. I, I grew up playing video games. I watched a ton of TV and films, but it's all about variety and having that um, chance to really forget about um, just the, the daily routine and really being present in a place where it's not it, it's not just about what you do every day and uh, the things to check off the list or anything like that. It's being able to let go, giving permission uh, to your for to yourself to be free to explore, to discover, to play, to engage, to interact with people that you wouldn't normally interact with. Um, to give you the courage, really, to be in a, a story and in a world where you might not initially feel comfortable about but really letting yourself go to enjoy it and to participate. I think that there's so many things going on in the world where you can just sit back and watch a thing or be passive observers. And as immersive storytellers, we really want our we really want people to step in and participate and to engage and to interact and to act. It's all these active verbs that we always think about when we create an immersive story world. Um, and that's how even when we think about a museum or a land or a ride or an attraction or a show, sometimes all, you know, sometimes the way that you can think about it is what are the active verbs that you want people to do? Is it to explore, to dive into a pool of sprinkles, to go down a slide, to climb this ladder, to, you know, uh, sit at a table where the plates come to life, um, to speak with a stranger that's next to you, to open a door that uh, opens to a portal into another world, right? It's all of these things that 
you know, you as a audience member, participant, uh, can have that opportunity to do that's unlike anything that you can do in your ordinary life. And as a storyteller, it's a really great privilege for you to have to create that opportunity for other people to immerse themselves in a world that, it, that they don't normally find themselves in. How does suspension of disbelief factor into a great opening? The great, a great opening is um, extremely important in terms of how quickly your visitor or audience member buys into the world that you're creating. And as much as, you know, it really starts from the very, very first moment of how you, you know, when you think about like how you um, walk down a path to get to the experience or, you know, the door that you open or the person that greets you. I think that every single detail and element that leads you to the main experience is something that helps to create that suspension of disbelief. And, you know, it, in my book, I talk about the uh, Walt's Haunted Mansion and how you think about the fact that, like, the um, pavement that you walk on, the, the graveyard that you go through, the wrought iron gate, um, the cast members that greet you and have that tone. It's immediately you get a sense that you're no longer in the place that you were just moments before in. Uh, in. And I think that being able to think about a story in all of those elements, not just um, telling a story verbally or uh, a story that's written, to think about how you create this immersive environment that makes you believe you are in a different place. When you think about going to um, travel to a different country, for example, the moment you get off a plane and go through the airport and, you know, get into a taxi, whatever it is, and arrive at a place, immediately you get a sense of uh, it's a different people, different culture, a different language, a different way of doing things, a different, different sounds, different smells, different textures, different temperature. Every time I think about creating an immersive story world, I think about traveling because that's one of my greatest passions and in life is to immerse myself in different countries and different cultures. And when you think about how every time you do travel to uh, a new country or a completely different place, there is this sense of excitement, anticipation, and adventure. And your visitor wants that 100%. They paid for your experience, you know, maybe it's free, whatever, but, you know, they're committed to your experience for that time period. And the better you can create that sense of place and to create that um, belief that they are truly walking into this world and this environment that you're creating and making it so seamless and consistent so that the pattern doesn't break because as humans, we are pattern recognizers. So if you are in a time period that's supposed to be the 1800s and then you see some modern technology on the wall, it immediately takes you out, you know, immediately. So how do you think about every single detail and element that takes and transports you and your, your audience member into a place that they are willingly able to suspend their disbelief and enter your world and willingly and openly want to participate and play and engage in it, then you've done your job well as a storyteller. Um, and that's something, you know, a lot of different mediums are really exploring and really trying to find ways in which to immerse audience members and um, visitors in new and unique ways. And, you know, I have to say video games do it very well, you know, from their inception until now, 
just seeing it evolve and how as a player you get to really immerse yourself in that story world immediately. Uh, that's something that a lot of immersive storytellers can really think about when they think about creating that world. You know, you think about video games and how immediately you are a character who has a role in this world and you have agency and whatever action you take has consequences. You, you know, whether you turn left or right or follow this character or not follow that character and go somewhere else, all of these things have these multi-branching stories and narratives that you as a player can follow. And that's something that's very exciting um, in the immersive storytelling world to explore. And, you know, a really great example is Sleep No More in uh, New York City, where you do have this deconstructed narrative of Macbeth. And you can follow these characters in different rooms and you follow a character in their storyline and you uh, can explore a room on your own. You can meet people. There's this sense of mystery and exploration and discovery that feels very, very unique. And I'm excited to see more and more of that. How can people really push the boundaries of what immersive storytelling is and how can you really involve not only uh, yourself as a participant, but the people around you to create something that feels like a shared narrative that together you're experiencing and that you're connecting on a deeper, meaningful level with complete strangers. I think that's some of the greatest magic that I see in immersive storytelling is that you're able to find um, that human connection that many times in our own lives, maybe we've lost. And you said too, two words that stuck out to me too, mystery and discovery. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about for myself, why I like certain stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a huge component. And you want to talk about being present in something yeah. when our mind is going like that. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as humans, we want to make sense of the world around us. And that's why, you know, mysteries and, you know, crime stories, murder mysteries, all of that, we want to go down that rabbit hole because we want to understand, you know, we want to find a reason for why people do the things they do. Would I do the same thing if I were in that same situation? Like all of these what ifs, right? And um, what ifs and what really happened? And, you know, what more can I discover? What more can I uh, find if I follow that, you know, path? Like that's why a story like Alice in Wonderland, right, is so captive, uh, captivating to us because it's really following a character that's uh, brave enough to go on that adventure and for us to follow along on that journey and to really discover what it means when you are brave, when you are fearless, when you do meet strange characters in your life, all of these things, I think like, there's an inner child in all of us that has that curiosity and that desire to discover and explore the world around us. What are some great openings in immersive storytelling? Oh boy. When you mm. talked about the greeting, it had mm -hmm. me even thinking about even a walking into a restaurant in some oh. sense is like, there's a little bit of storytelling, but you talk about greeters. Mm -hmm. And, and and just taking you immediately into that world and knowing that you've left one world and going into another. Yeah. You know. I mean, um, there's one experience that I have to call out is called The Nest in Los Angeles. And they, unfortunately, they're closing soon. So I think people have a few weeks to book it before it um, the production closes down. But it's an immersive uh, world where you know, you, you go into this building and one of the first things they do is put you into um, uh, a really old rickety elevator. And you go up on this, you know, journey that very curious, very mysterious, and you don't know what's really going on. You go up, just you and one other person um, goes up on this rickety elevator and you're basically... Uh, told in a letter 
that you've inherited uh, a storage unit. And so you go through the storage unit and piece by piece, you uncover the story of this woman's life. She has recently passed away and through a very clever medium, um, which is just old school cassette tapes that you put into a cassette player in each of the rooms, there's, uh, there's actual activities that you're doing and action that you're taking uh, to discover this uh, woman's life. And everything from like, uh, you hear her voice from childhood to when she's an older woman. I think they really cleverly put that together. Um, these two uh, former Imagineers who put this experience together. That was a really great opener for me. Um, a really memorable one where you really feel transported and you do suspend your disbelief to really explore this um, creepy, in fact, a creepy environment for you to really uncover the story of this woman's life. That's fascinating. So you said it's closing down soon? Yeah, in a few weeks. Well, in a few weeks. Uh, it, forever? Um, or, or? Forever, but they're probably going to do other projects. Um, but for now, it's um, they. Uh, it was running for a few months. Maybe, I don't know, don't, no, no, don't quote me on it. It was running for a few months, but um, there, it was a really clever way to tell a, a story in a very contained way and controlled environment. And the only thing that you're given is a tape recorder and a flashlight. And so you're going into this very immersive, um, from, you know, a hallway of a storage unit. And at one point you're developing um, film, you know, to look at some clues to open a lock, like all of these things. And you feel really emotionally invested to find out, um, really the story of what happened to this uh, woman who left behind the storage unit for you. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. So you get this letter from like a barrister or an attorney or whatever, and it says you're the you know beneficiary of this estate. Yeah, I think it was, you won, you won the storage unit. Oh, you uh, won, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, interesting. And yeah. so then, you, and do you, you f f see parts of her life, uh, not just here? Yeah, and speak? it's all out of order too, so it's a non-linear storytelling. Oh, and, um, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah, so they really did a um, great job in putting that together and really thinking about, this is another way, like when you think about, like you don't have to have, you know, millions of dollars to create an immersive story. You, you know, simply use what's around you to best represent the, the feeling that you want in creating this place. So um, yeah, The Nest, really, I, I definitely recommend that. In your new book, you talk about the story method. And if I may, it's a share, theme, one of a kind, reflect and yearn. Mm -hmm. And so the acronym is S-T-O-R-Y. Mm -hmm. What is this and why is it important? I was really trying to find a way to make it really easy for storytellers to remember the five important things um, to consider when they're creating their story. And the first one is S for story. Why share this story with the world? Why is extremely important in trying to understand why uh, Why tell the story? Why do people need, need to know it and hear it? And from your perspective as a storyteller, you have to really understand that and really know the answer to why you're sharing this story with the world. T is theme. And for any good story, there should be a theme. And this is really what your story is about. Um, and when you think about you know, children's books and fables and fairy tales, some of your favorite ones. You might not know it, but there is a theme, a recurring theme that occurs throughout the story. And sometimes it's uh, a lesson, a cautionary tale. Um, it could be something that really puts a perspective on your life or others, someone else's life, but something that you can reflect upon your own life. But what is what is the story really about? It's not just about the plot of this happens to this character and this and this happens in the end, but the theme is really what is this story about? 
um, in the, not in the sense of the plot, but in terms of the real meaning behind it. The O one of a kind is if you are going to share the story with the world, how is it unique? Can you place a twist upon it? Can you set it in a different environment? Can you have different characters? Can you tell that story in a different culture, in a different world, in a different time period so that it feels fresh again? Because when you think about some of the really popular stories, you know, the, the Shakespearean Romeo and Juliet, like there's all these different versions and ways that you can tell that story. So how can you make it feel fresh and relevant and unique and one of a kind? That's something that not only just in terms of like putting a, your own perspective or a twist on it, but perhaps the medium that you tell that story in. Can you make it into, uh, you know, an opera or, you know, a, a, a children's book or, um, you know, changing the tone? Can you make it into a mystery rather than a drama, all of, the, all of these things to really make it feel one of a kind. R in the story method is reflect. And that's really questioning why you are the best person to tell that story. And it might not just be you as an individual. If it is your own personal project, yes, that is the question that you should ask. But if you're um, in a team or you're working for a company or a client, why are they, why are the company, the client, uh, whoever you're working with, why are they the best people to tell that story? And so that reflection is really holding a mirror up on yourself, the storyteller, the creator, the one who's going to um, you know, share this story with the world. You really have to understand why you should be the voice for it and to really, and if you are the voice, what is this perspective, the unique perspective that you're sharing with the world? Because once you understand that, then it will feel one of a kind. It will feel authentic. It will feel like it's coming from a genuine place rather than one that is contrived or um, something that feels like it's been done before or something that doesn't feel like it's anything new or interesting. So what is that different uh, perspective that you can bring in as a storyteller and a creator to make it feel like there was no one else in the world who can tell that story better than you? Why in the story method is uh, yearn? And that's really about the audience wish fulfillment. And this is something that I always go back to again and again, is that each one of us, you know, in our lives has a deep desire and a fantasy that we want to fulfill. And for one person, it might be to fulfill the desire of being in a world of vampires and uh, feeling like you are a creature of the night. Um, another person might be having this wish fulfillment of like, what does it feel like to be a world famous musician? You know, um, what kind of a lifestyle can I live by going into that world? Some people want to uh, step into a fantastical world like Star Wars or Harry Potter, um, fictional worlds that are very, uh, really expansive and large. And, you know, what is that wish fulfillment for your particular audience member? It's all about understanding and respecting who your audience is and what you can not only, you know, about meeting their expectations, but about meeting that, the exceeding those expectations and really fulfilling on that guest promise. Um, so when you think about creating an experience and, um, you know, what to think about what your audience member, what your visitor should, would want to do in this place, you always think back to, well, what is their wish fulfillment? What is the thing that they aspire to do? What is it that they dream of doing? Um, when they think about this world and this place. And that's a really great place to start. We talked about earlier how you love to see the element of surprise on the children's faces. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sure adult children as well. It, mm -hmm. it must be very exciting to see, you know, the parents that are, might be there for equal reasons because they want to attend. Yeah. And, and their element of surprise. Yeah, because, you know, all of us have that inner child within us. And I think that when we create these immersive stories for children of all ages to experience, including adults, um, and the adults that never really grew up, uh, you know, you really have that, when you create that space to give them permission to be children again, to really let loose and play and engage and laugh and dance and do all the things that you can't do in your normal life, adult life, I think that we need more of that. We need more opportunities for um, people to really play again and to um, fulfill their childlike curiosity and to have that feeling of being adventurous again and to really um, expose yourselves to worlds and to people that are unfamiliar to you. I think that when we start living a life where we're more closed in and rather than expanding our mindset and you know, exploring the world and meeting different people and experiencing what their lives can be like. That's something that I hope to do in a lot of the um, stories that I create. And whenever I experience someone else's story, I feel like I want to know more about the people and the world that, I, you know, that are, that surround me. I feel like that's a way for us to better understand each other um, to put ourselves in other people's shoes, to really think about um, the world through their eyes and through their perspectives, because only then can we have compassion for each other and empathy, um, and only then can we really have meaningful dialogue and conversation. So storytelling is a really great way for people to... Um, you know, connect with each other, even people that you've never met before from the other side of the world, right? So it's a way, it's a bridge. It's a bridge from one person to another. It's a, it's a way for you to be able to share something that you, that doesn't cost anything really when you tell a story to someone else, right? It's a way that you can reveal a bit of yourself um, and for them to understand who you are and where you come from and what your story is about, all of these things, I think it's just um, a really great way for us to connect more as, as a society, as a world. A well-told story should feel almost like a roller coaster ride? Yeah, I, I believe that. I think that a well-told story has ups and downs, and it has twists and turns, and it surprises and delights you and terrifies you. Um, I think that a really well-told story should have that variety of emotions. Uh, and I think that when you think about some of your favorite movies and books and experiences, they really take you on that journey from beginning, middle, and end. Um, they take you on a journey where you truly let yourself go, you are present, you suspend your disbelief, and you trust that the storyteller and creator is gonna take you on this magical journey. And it's not just about the thrills and the screams and the excitement, but it's about that anticipation. You think about a roller coaster from the moment that you're lining up to get on the vehicle itself, your heart is beating, you're excited talking to your family and your friends, um, you're trying to, you know, you're so pumped up and excited to go on this adventure. And even when you climb into the vehicle and you have your safety on you and everything, going off of that ramp and, you know, when you start chugging up the track, it's, you are not thinking about anything else. You know, you're thinking about, oh my gosh, I'm just going to go on this really fast ride and there's nothing I can do. I'm out of control, right? I have to trust 
that this coaster is going to take me back safely to where I started. But for those few moments, you really let yourself go and be present and just enjoy the ride. Um, and I feel like well-told stories do that, right? You trust that you're going to be taken to some extraordinary place to go on your hero's journey, if you will, and really depart on this and embark on this adventure where you have this excitement and this anticipation and you go on a thrilling, you know, twists and turns and ups and downs and all kinds of things that you don't have control over. And you're surprised by how not only, you know, you survive in the end that you had a great time, but it's this feeling of, I think this, this, this release of control that is extremely, perhaps very exciting for a lot of people because all your life, um, for the most part, you have to really think about what you're doing and planning and, you know, it's a checklist of things to do and accomplish and all of these things. And sometimes it just feels good to let someone else take control for a little bit and take you on this really great journey. And that's why I think a lot of people come back to like theme parks and amusement parks and everything, because it's a way for you to truly, um, you know, let yourself play and release yourself from all these inhibitions and um, engage in something that feels extraordinary, that is not, is out of the ordinary life that you live and being able to transport yourself to this playful, um, you know, playground of sorts where you can really go on an adventure is something that um, a well-told story does. And the, the beauty of it is it's not thrill every minute. There, mm -hmm. There's peaks and valleys to yes. it. And yeah. And there are a lot of peaks and valleys in well-told stories. I mean, you know, well-told stories make you cry as much as you laugh, right? Um, they touch you. They, you know, some stories can be extremely tragic, but uh, there's a glimmer of hope in the end. Um, so all of these emotions of positive and negative emotions and neither, are, you know, they're not good or bad. They're just the scale of emotions, the spectrum of emotions that we as human beings experience. Um, and so when I think about, you know, going on a roller coaster, um, it's really, uh, you know, a metaphor to the, the life of, um, you know, the journey of a well-told story in which there are these peaks and valleys and there are ups and downs and all of them are okay. You know, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel to feel scared and terrified because that is the human experience. Um, and I think that if, you know, you live your life wanting to experience uh, the peak all the time, then you haven't truly lived. You haven't, you know, experienced all that life has to offer for you. And that's why really great stories take you there and make you really reflect on, um, you know, all the various emotions that you can experience in your life and how you can reflect upon it um, in your own life with, a, with your own family and friends and how you can um, experience this colorful spectrum that is life. Where does the creative process begin for an immersive story? The creative process begins with a lot of research. That's something that I think everyone should always do as a step one. If you are uh, going to tell a story, especially a story that's not yours to own, um, I think that really understanding the subject matter, um, talking to experts and having the appropriate subject matter experts and advisors to help you truly understand a topic and a world is extremely important. I think that if you jump into um, the creative process without understanding the context, the significance, you know, what's important about that particular story, 
is, uh, can be very problematic. So I always want to find um, mul multiple perspectives on a particular subject matter or topic or world, whatever it is, to truly understand, especially if it's nonfiction, especially if it's something biographical, especially if it's historical or educational, even if it's not, even if it's a fictional world, um, you have to respect uh, the subject matter and the story. So I think that research is um, number one, the first step that you must take as a storyteller to any project that you work on. Can you talk about the brainstorming process? You know, there's so many different ways to brainstorm an idea, but I think as a creative process and as creatives and creative collaborators, it's a really great way to all be together in a room when you brainstorm an idea. And it, depending on the scope of your project and the kind of project that you have, you may bring in some different disciplines to really think about your world through their various um, skill set. So you might have um, an illustrator or an architect or a writer or a creative director or a landscape designer. It really depends on the subject matter that you're working with. But ultimately, you want to have all these uh, various representatives, if you will, of all these creative di disciplines come together so that you're able to create something that is uh, seamless and integrated. Because you're using multiple senses to experience uh, an immersive story, you want to make sure that all of these voices are present in the room, at the table, um, cultural experts, um, story, uh, you know, subject matter experts, all of these things. It's a way for you to really throw out all the ideas and brainstorm all the good and bad ideas together so that you can really understand what's important about the story you want to share with the world. And hearing it from all these different disciplines and from different people and voices is extremely important to make sure that you have a very diverse and representative uh, uh, representation of uh, a story that is truly unique and authentic. On the flip side, though, let's take an example of like you know the the quote "too many cooks spoil mm -hmm. the broth." Mm -hmm. So if we have too many people, how does it dilute it? I mean, when do you know I think I have a good mix? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a really, uh, it's a good question. And I think that a lot of times um, we, you want to, it really depends on what we're talking about because there are certain instances where you feel like you really want to focus on an idea or a topic and really brainstorm from that idea. But sometimes I think that it's good to start out, it's good to start out bigger in some sense and maybe you narrow it down from there. Um, I think that it's important to have uh, important voices heard in the beginning because that really shapes how you create that story um, throughout the life cycle of a project. And it really gives, you know, as the creator, a storyteller, you want to, at least for me personally, I want to hear everyone's ideas and as the story champion, as the person who's going to create this story, I want to make sure that all the voices within that within the team are heard, first and foremost. And in a way, my job is to be a curator, to decide which of these um, perspectives are the ones that we really want to focus on, which are the ones that are important but may not take the spotlight in this particular point in time, um, what are the ones, what are the ways that we can tell a story that's not so, um, you know, uh, overt, I guess? Can we tell stories in ways that are more um, contextual and more suggestive rather than something that is very um, obvious? So I know that seems very, like, strange to think about because surely, like, with all the voices in my head, it would be confusing or distracting perhaps, but I think it depends. But for me, I really want to hear it all. It's kind of like a funnel if you, you know, for lack of a better analogy, 
I want to hear it all. I want to hear all the different perspectives. And from there, really be able to hone in and focus on what's really important. What are the common themes? What are the common patterns? What are the common things people are saying that have a, a unified, a more unified um, approach to how we can tell that story? So ultimately, once you know you have all the voices heard and you hear all the different perspectives, you can have smaller groups and breakout sessions to consider, okay, now that we have this greater idea, this big idea concept of what our project is about, now let's um, we can go into smaller groups of like, how do we tell that story in this particular room? How do we tell that story in the dining experience? How do we tell that story in the retail experience, right? So in that sense, you can have more focused groups to think about it. But, you know, as a storyteller, you you kind of have to do both. You have, you're a generalist and you're also a specialist when it comes time for it. Um, you really have to think about how you can use all of these different um, stories, ideas, perspectives in uh, a much bigger arching uh, story, uh, story arc and then find ways in which you can be more defined and focused in different elements of your entire experience. So there's different ways that you can do that, but I think that it really depends on how much time you have, you know, uh, how much money you have, frankly, for the project as well, and really think about how best to approach it in the most efficient and uh, effective way. What was your role in creating Star Wars Galaxy's Edge? I started out as a, a writer for uh, the overall land and what we called the village at the time. So all of the various um, retail and dining and character experiences. And as we thought about building a whole new planet, um, one that we have never seen before in the Star Wars galaxy, we worked really closely with uh, the Lucasfilm and the Imagineering teams to really develop a place that felt truly Star Wars, that had the DNA of what made Star Wars Star Wars. And so I became sort of this uh, uh, story lead, for lack of a better word, to really connect and tie all of the various rides and attractions and experiences together as a holistic place, as uh, a world that um, spoke to each other. And that didn't feel like it was just standalone ride here, you know, a retail here, a dining experience here that felt disconnected. We really wanted to find a way where it felt like everyone from um, the cast members to the characters that you encounter to um, the uh, travelers that come to this planet they all have a place in the story and they acknowledge each other. So everything from like the training of our cast members, the local Batuans, we call them, to um, the travelers that come to this planet, we really developed a culture and a language and customs um, to make it feel like it was a real place in the Star Wars galaxy. And it was a really great way for us to really push storytelling in all kinds of different mediums from, um, you know, audio storytelling to um, graphical to um, the props that we used. They were There were a lot of Easter eggs from like the films and the TV shows that for Star Wars fans, when they walk by it and see it, they're like, recognize it, you know. We really wanted everyone to feel like they belong in this world. Um, no matter what your level of fandom was. We wanted everyone from someone who knew nothing about Star Wars to the really super fans of Star Wars to really enjoy this place and to want to come back again and again and again. Uh, so my role was really to work with an incredible team of creatives and, you know, uh, all kinds of other uh, everyone from like the engineers to the architects to, you know, everyone to create this wonderful space to make it feel like it was a believable, authentic planet in the Star Wars galaxy. 
Can you tell us about the research that you did for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge? <laughs> I, I feel like I got a PhD in Star Wars in my time at uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. I, it was such a privilege working with the Lucasfilm team. Uh, they were so open and collaborative from the very beginning when we first uh, had the conversations of building an immersive Star Wars themed land. And I remember um, the one of the uh, um, team members of the Lucasfilm story team had said, you know, we haven't told all of the stories in the Star Wars universe. We're curious to hear what stories you'd like to tell. And that really opened the doors for us um, to really think about how we can collaborate with them to create a story that feels like something one of a kind, something unique, and something that makes it feel welcoming to everyone. And um, having that experience of researching, I mean, in addition to re-watching, you know, all of the films back to back, reading all the, uh, um, watching the Clone Wars series, the Rebels series, um, the animated series, comic books, graphic novels, books, I mean, we all, it wasn't just me, we all did our research in terms of, you know, what can we draw? What characters do we love? What, what do we love about Star Wars that we want to bring into this land? And it was really starting from that, you know, wish fulfillment of um, what is that bucket list of things that we as audience members and fans want to do in a Star Wars world. Um, and it involved everything from we want to meet a droid to we want to hold a lightsaber. You know what? We want to build a lightsaber um, and we want to uh, feel the force. We want to pilot the Millennium Falcon. Like we want to be in the hallways of a, a destroyer. Like all of these things we as a team came together and talked about and got really excited about. And it was incredible and what a great honor and privilege to work in a universe that George Lucas created that opened up our imaginations, you know, all of our imaginations um, at a time when, you know, science fiction and like, you know, that type of storytelling was not really something that was popular. And when uh, the first film, Star Wars film came out, it just kind of blew everyone away. And we wanted to do that again when we wanted to build this land. Um, this was going to be the first time that fans can walk into a land that was, you know, 360 degree experience, multi-sensory experience. The first time that Star Wars fans and new fans would come in and step into a world that was truly Star Wars. And that's a really big, big privilege. You know, fans have waited over 40 years to walk into a place like this. And we did not take that lightly. You know, we did our research with, um, you know, uh, Lucasfilm and with all kinds of experts to really get into the heart of what would make this place really compelling. And, you know, did we get everything right? Maybe not, no. But we felt like this was a place that really transported people to, uh, you know, and you know when I talk about the the emotional ride of a roller coaster, I've seen people cry, I've seen people laugh, and you know grab their children running to a place, and children grabbing parents running to a place, and you know me taking my own family and friends into it, and seeing the delight in their faces, and walking away from an attraction or an experience, and being like, wow. You know, that, that's everything to me. To be able to be a part of something like that was one of the greatest honors and privileges of my career. In creating an immersive story, why do you focus on audience before you focus on the characters in the world? I think that when we think about immersive storytelling, we always go back to the idea of you know, the, the person, the audience member who's coming into committing their time and energy into the space, how do we create an experience for them that is truly immersive? And in any other type of storytelling, it is about another person's story. 
It's another character going on their own journey, having this adventure. But in immersive storytelling, the hero, the protagonist, is your audience member, is your visitor. They're the ones who want to commit this time to going on a journey that is for them, that is unique to them, that's personal to them, perhaps. Um, and so when we think about creating an immersive storytelling world or experience, it is a multi-dimensional video game come to life. This player, if you will, is going into this experience and into this world to do something, to experience something. And so we create a story and a narrative and a world around them. And they are the, um, the first person perspective of looking around um, you know, a space, an environment, and a world. We see it through their eyes. And so, you know, when I think about any type of experience that I build, I always think that I am guest zero. You know, I, I want to uh, create a world and a story where I am the visitor that is experiencing this for the first time. And how do I really put myself in their shoes and see things through their eyes and experience things through the way that they would experience it? Because when we have the first guest, the first visitor who comes in, they should um, be aligned with, you know, the experience that I and the team have created in order to create something that is truly, truly compelling and engaging. And we want to surprise people and we want to make sure that we engage with them um, in a way that really opens up their minds, you know, shakes them up or makes them think about and see the world in a different way. Um, whatever your goal is in your experience, you really, really have to consider what they're experiencing through their eyes and through their perspective in order to feel um, that this is an, you know, an experience that is emotionally engaging and meaningful. Uh, and I think that it's so important to think about it from their perspective because they are the hero of your story. They are the protagonist. So how do you create a journey and an adventure, an experience that is about them? Um, so it's a very, very daunting task because maybe one person's perspective or um, experience of a place can be different from another person who experiences the same thing. And that's completely fine because no two human beings are alike. But how do you create a world, a story, a place that really makes them feel something, that perhaps transforms them? Because that's something as storytellers and creators we want to do, is we want to transform people. We want to change them in a positive way. Um, in, in a way that opens up their minds, broaden their horizons, um, allows them to explore and play and engage and discover in ways that they never thought they would. You know, maybe there are even experiences that makes them feel more like themselves than they would normally feel in their ordinary lives. You know, we hear about people who um, you know, uh, have an avatar that's of a different gender or plays a role that they don't normally play in their real lives. And in perhaps in this experience, they can truly feel more themselves than they've ever been. And so the, the role of the storyteller is so important to be able to allow for that platform, that, for that world to exist for people to truly feel like um, they belong, that they connect, that they can understand the world around them in a way that feels very meaningful and purposeful to them. How does the storyteller know who their audience is? That's a really good question. I think that sometimes you don't always know. Um, I think that if you are working on a particular story um, that's, you know, popular knowledge or, you know, of pop culture, you know who your fandom is, your target audience is. But 
if you're working on a story for a museum or uh, a larger general audience, I think that as much as possible, you want to be inclusive of everyone. Um, and I think that you really want to um, maybe research in terms of like the market that you're in, uh, who's most likely um, going to attend your experience, but also knowing your age group as well. Is this an experience for children? Is this an experience for teenagers? Is this an experience for adults or for everyone? And it's extremely challenging to try to please everyone, but you want to uh, make sure, depending on your experience, you want to make sure that it is inclusive of everyone so that they feel like they can belong in your story world. Um, and if it isn't appropriate for a younger audience or for a particular group of people, then that's something that you need to uh, communicate beforehand. You know, That's something that you want to make sure that your uh, audience's expectations of the experience is what they think it is. Uh, so I think that it really depends on who you're trying to reach out to and whether or not um, that truly is your audience sometimes can be surprising. Um, sometimes it doesn't necessarily, you know, what you expect to be your, you know, maybe your, the, the majority of your audience members might, it might not turn out to be that way. And you're going to be more appealing for the younger audience or whoever it is, right? Like, I think that it just, it, it depends on your experience for sure. And the audience will surprise you. Sometimes you think they're going to love one thing mm -hmm. and it turns out they actually hate it or they love something that you never even considered. Yeah. And and a lot of the times in you know, in this industry, you make changes, you adapt, right? If something doesn't work out, if something isn't you know, built to the expectation of the audience, how can you improve upon it and how how can you change it? How can you make some amends so that it is something that they were hoping to experience, something that is more compelling. And I think when you think about designing your experience, you want to keep in mind that there could that you should be flexible in that. You should think about um, how, if you needed to make a change, it's not going to be so time consuming or costly to your project. Can you find ways in which it can be classic and evergreen? Um, are there ways that it could be a, an easy way for you to switch out, you know, a character or an element of a story, whatever it is, so that it always feels relevant and current um, and, um, you know, something that is always new, that feels new to people. So it really, yeah, it really depends, I think, on um, the subject matter and also, you know, how you what you're trying to accomplish in the first place, like really understanding what the goal of that experience is and um, yeah, knowing who your audience is. Who are streakers, strollers, and students? Oh, okay. So this is a, a term that was coined um, a few decades ago by a museum educator. And uh, especially in the museum industry, there's the the streakers, the strollers, the students, or uh, also sometimes called the streakers, the strollers, the scholars. Um, street, if you think about going to a museum, the streakers are the ones who just kind of want to walk through all of the galleries, all of the rooms, and just get a glimpse of everything um, quickly. And the strollers are the ones who, you know, they'll take time to meander through all the galleries, maybe stop at a particular painting or piece of art and really enjoy it before they move on to the next object. And the scholars or the students are the ones who want to absorb everything about that particular piece of work or every single piece of work in the museum. So as a museum designer or an experienced creator, you wanna think about all of those different levels of engagement, if you will, and how do you create an experience that is appealing to all of them? Um, there could be, you know, I see examples in museums where they have like just a short description or a title of a painting and the artist. 
And um, if you want to read further, you can. There's more information. And if you want to dive even deeper, maybe you'll listen to a podcast or the audio tour. Um, or you go on one of the um, tours with one of the guides, right? So having that um, different options for your visitors to engage with whatever level that feels comfortable to them, that makes them feel like they, you know, got their uh, um, their value for coming to visit your experience is a really great way to think about how you want to create um, an experience that will appeal to all those levels of um, participants. And, you know, there's other ways that people think about it. It's, you know, in a fictional world, it's levels of fandom. Um, and some people like to think about it as like, you know, uh, what's it's the, the waders, the swimmers, and the divers is also another way that people talk about you know, how deeply they want to immerse themselves in a story, a world, or a topic. And so it's uh, it's really good to keep that in the back of your mind when you're creating a place. Because if it is uh, an experience that's designed for young children, let's say, then maybe it is more about um, the very, you know, the, the streakers or the waiters, right? They just want to get a sense of everything, just a little bit of here and there, and they're not going to be reading every single plaque on the wall or anything like that. They're going to move on to the other thing. But if you're creating an experience that perhaps is historical or biographical, um, then you want to make sure that you are being 100% um, accurate and fair and responsible in sharing that story with the world. So it's an extremely big responsibility as a creator and a storyteller to think about all those different levels of engagement um, and how they can participate in your story and your world. Can we talk about the six types of audience roles? Mm -hmm. Okay, the first one is a visitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the visitor is when you what you think of when you have an art gallery or a museum um, where the visitor comes in and they enjoy um, and appreciate works of art or objects or, um, you know, they come to learn, they come to um, appreciate a place, but they don't play a role in the story of the experience. They are visitors to the place where uh, the environment, the story world is not affected by their presence. So this is the most common uh, type of uh, experience where people will go to a, you know, everything from a playground to a museum, they're visiting a place and they don't have an active role to play in the experience. So it's passive. Yes. Passive. Okay. And then number two is a spectator. Mm -hmm. That also sounds passive. Yeah. A spectator um, has, is a more passive uh, participant as well. You could think of like um, sporting events or concerts but there's a little bit of participation in that they can respond to the performer or to the athlete. They, you know, they can clap, they can scream, they can shout their support, all of the, or boo, right? Um, so there's a little bit more participation, but it's it's still somewhat passive. It's not as uh, um, participatory as um, other forms of um, visitors. Number three is participant hyphen immersive. Mm -hmm. When you think about uh, some of the immersive experiences out there um, where they have projection mapping around a space and the, um, the, the environment reacts towards the participant that goes into this immersive space, maybe you touch something and, you know, there's like fish, in an, uh, a digital fish in an aquarium, let's say. And if you you can feed the fish by like, you know, touching on the wall or something like that. So there is a form of participation that requires you to engage with the immersive environment around you. It doesn't change the story in a drastic way, but it responds to you as you touch or um, perhaps uh, whatever kind of action that you do to create something that may have uh, um, a small consequence 
but nothing that is going to change the outcome of the entire experience or the story. It's a light touch, light touch participation. Participant interactive. So uh, participant interactive is um, a little more engaging. Uh, perhaps it's a crank that you have to turn in order for this invention or this machine to work. Maybe it's some buttons that you have to push. Maybe it's uh, you know handles uh, that you have to pull and look through and discover. So there's a sense that it is interactive, that you are required to take some action in order to fully experience uh, the story and the world. And it's a great way for kids to um, explore the world around them. So I love seeing uh, museums and places where kids can just touch everything and interact with things so that they can learn about it. Um, science museums is a really great example of that. And uh, just really engaging, um, actively participatory type of activities uh, where you can really see uh, you know, results and consequences to your to your actions. Number five, hero. So hero is one in which if you go through this experience and the story world, the characters, the experiences around you uh, have a direct consequence to your actions. So if you are going to meet with a character in a town, let's say in this world, um, whatever you say or do with this particular um, character is going to have very big consequences to the world. So this is really the most extreme form of immersive storytelling. How can you as a creator put your visitor into a hero role where they can change the consequences of the story and the world? And again, I go back to video games, you know, gaming uh, where you truly have this opportunity to change the, um, you know, the cho choose your own adventure type of format where you can um, change the outcome of your story and other characters' um, outcomes as well is the most extreme form of immersive storytelling that you can do. And I think we have yet to really see um, uh, an experience where they, it fully does that, where you can truly create uh, an outcome that is personal, extremely personal to you. It's difficult and challenging because you have, you know, mass groups of people, visitors, audiences coming to a place. So how can you create a story that's tailored only to you and personalized only to you when you're in this setting with crowds of people? And so there are different ways that you can do it. There's some that um, makes it a truly personal experience or just you and one other person. If you think about like um, some of the experiences out there in the world when you're traveling, let's say, and you have a private guide who takes you to, through a safari or whatever it is, right? There's, there's varying ways for you to be the hero of that story and that journey. Um, but it's, it's still one that we're, we've touched the surface of in immersive storytelling and I think we have a long way to go to really create something that is truly, um, that truly makes you feel like you are the hero of the story. And I'm really excited to see where it can take us. And then creator, last but not least. This is one that I think, gosh, you know, when I think about where immersive storytelling can go and how I'm seeing the trends of what you know, my kid and the younger generations are doing in their own free time, things like Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite, where, and, you know, being YouTubers, there is a desire to create and express yourself in uh, uh, your own way. How do we create an immersive storytelling experience or world where we can embrace you as a creator? And this is perhaps touching on, you know, the metaverse or touching on something that, you know, AR or something that is more virtual. But is there a world where there is a combination of like the physical, the digital, the virtual, where it feels like perhaps there's no boundaries anymore, right? And it for a lot of people that can be really scary to think about, 
you know, what's real and what's not. Um, but when I see what's, what's emerging in this world and how we all want to have that sense of ownership and uh, a sense of creation, I think that this is really going to be what's going to be very exciting in this particular format of immersive storytelling. How can you create a world that is specific to you and have visitors perhaps come to your world, experience the story that you set up? We see that in TV and movies and video games. Maybe we can see that in the physical world. Maybe we can see that in a way that is um, scalable, uh, you know, that other people from some other part of the world can come and experience the world that you've created. And how do you create something, you know, invite others to come and co-create with you? Um, how do you create environments that change with time, that evolve over time, that perhaps does it organically. I know that it's something that um, I'm very excited to see because it really pushes how we think about how we perceive the world. And what is, you know, all my life since I was a child, I think there's always been, you know, multiple worlds that I live in in my head. And imagine if there is going to be a landscape where you can go in and out of those worlds as you please, that it doesn't just live in your head, that it can be uh, um, manifested into something that other people can see and share, and that you can continually change and evolve into uh, an ecosystem that other people can come in and collaborate as well. And again, we're seeing it in video games, we're seeing it in all of this, but how do we, how can we bring that into the physical world? What are emotional anchors in immersive storytelling? Emotional anchors are a really great way for you to think about how each experience of your world should feel. So if you think about, if you're creating a, a land, let's say, and you have an overarching theme of what this land is about, and like the, emotional roller coaster that I talk about, what is it about each of these places that makes you feel all those different emotions? So there might be a particular experience that's about um, mystery, that's about um, you know having that sense of discovering something mysterious. And perhaps that is the emotional anchor of that place, is it's mysterious. It's capturing that sense of you wanting to find out the secrets of a place. And what does that look like? How does that manifest into something physical? It might be, uh, there might be another area where it's all about love and friendship and companionship. And what does that look like in your world, in your, in your environment? And it's, and what kind of love is, is it? What kind of friendship is it? So when you think about all these different emotional anchors in your land or in your environment, um, it's a really great way for you to ensure that you have that spectrum of emotions that is felt throughout uh, your entire story world and experience. And you know there might be some areas that are um, you know light touches of emotion. It could just be like a moment of humor. Uh, human, uh, a moment of like um, playfulness, let's say. And so those emotional anchors are a way for your audience members. If you think about like watching a movie or reading a book, there are moments where you laugh out loud. There are moments where you cry. So we're just laying that out in a physical world, right? Like what does that look like? And having those emotional anchors there um, not knowing where your audience member necessarily might go to first as well. But if you can ensure that everyone does for the most part go to all of these emotional anchors and feel it, then they will have a more cohesive experience to your world that you've set up and to ensure that they go through that whole emotional roller coaster of your, of your experience.
Why do you compare emotional anchors to plot points? Like a good story um, in a movie or a book, there's plot points are usually um, the the moments in the story where things something happens, right? Something big happens and it changes the course of the hero's journey. Um, so when you think about emotional anchors, and depending on whether it's a linear experience or a non-linear one, you have to think about them as plot points as well. They are those significant moments in the story where perhaps the course of the hero's journey changes. It, it alters based on um, what they decide to do, the action that they take. So if you're looking at your visitor as the hero of the journey, they may decide to come to this particular place, the plot point where they experience that particular emotional anchor and then move on to the next thing, to the next thing, because you want to create this, this journey of sorts where we do have those peaks and valleys of the, um, the arc of the experience for that hero. So in a way, it, I, I uh, compare it to the more traditional form of storytelling in which we do have plot points. Emotional anchors are a really great way to think about um, it as a plot point to your particular experience. How do you create emotional anchors? I think it really depends, really understanding um, what it is what emotion you're trying to capture for your audience and really um, understanding if it's, you know, how it's crucial to the story of the experience. So it's, it's hard to talk about it when we're talk, not talking about something that's specific, a project or a story or a world, but you really want to capture that um, emotion in your visitor in which they can feel like they've progressed or that they're learning something or they're discovering something about themselves or the world or another character or the plot or the story arc of the journey. It's about revealing layers to not only the, the hero themselves, but as I mentioned, like to other characters or to the world. And in each discovery, of these, uh, in each emotional anchors, it's a really great way to reveal different sides of the story um, to make it more complex, to make it more layered. So if you have an experience that's just one emotional beat and tone, it feels very flat. You think about any song, you know, or any musical score. There are no, you know, great songs out there that's just one note, right? Um, so how do you create that textured, that multi-layered uh, narrative and emotional beats where it does reveal something else about the world or the environment that is surprising and that reveals an emotion that you didn't think you would have about a particular circumstance or a situation or even a character, right? Um, so it's a really great tool for you to think about how you can uh, create something that is very textural, that feels very um, intentional in its design, and how you can layer in uh, more, you know, storylines, story, like, or feelings to a place rather than just the one, the one note of, uh, 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 of an emotion. Margaret, in world building, what do you mean by if you make it personal, you will make it universal? I think it's so important to think about how you can make a story extremely personal and authentic to your voice for people to understand it in a greater context. I made the mistake when I first started out as a writer, thinking that I would write something that everyone would love. And, um, you know, looking at all the my favorite movies and books and everything and trying to find a story that is pleasing to everyone. And I, I over the years, I learned that it's really when you dive deep 
into yourself and trying to find the stories that really make you who you are in your own life um, and drawing upon those experiences, life experiences to make it feel genuine and personal in any story that you work on later in life. And so when I work on anything, I draw on that personal experience because anyone, you know, a, a visitor, a reader, a spectator can feel that it's not authentic or genuine if it's something that's fabricated. And the more that you make it personal, I find that, you know, this is the whole phrase of write what you know. I didn't understand that until later on in life. That now I understand that that's what it means, that you have to make it personal in order for people to understand. And that it goes back to, uh, you know, what makes us human, the universal human truths that we all share. We all love, hate, we understand revenge and envy and jealousy and all of these things, but we all experience it in different worlds and contexts with different people in our lives and you know different situations. But when you make it personal and you draw on something that is extremely felt um, in your own way and you're able to express that and manifest that into a story that is extremely personal to you, then I believe it is universal to anyone who experiences it. Margaret, what's the three second rule that you refer to in your new book? So the three second rule is if you're creating a world or um, an immersive experience, if your audience member doesn't understand the world they're in in three seconds or less, then you have not successfully um, suspended their disbelief. And this idea came, uh, you know, the first time I heard it was uh, a story about George Lucas when he was creating his um, the Star Wars universe is that when an audience member looks at a Star Wars world and if it doesn't feel, and he was creating it, you know, if it doesn't feel like something that belonged in the world he was creating, then it does not belong. Um, so it was a really interesting way to look at the world that you're creating to make sure that it's consistent throughout um, your whole experience. And if you're creating something that is truly immersive, then it should feel immersive from every to every single detail from beginning to end. And it should be, it should all speak, uh, you know, in the same, you know, it should feel like it belongs in the same world. Um, it should feel like it isn't jarring or that it's out of context or it breaks the pattern of your world. It's a way for the audience to connect the dots and continue that journey and that believability that they are living in this or stepping into this immersive world. So it's a really great way for you to look at the world that you're creating, whether it's in a video game or, a, or a, an experience, a physical experience. If you have someone walk in and look at a place and in three seconds, if they don't tell you exactly what you're trying to build, then you need to get back to work. You need to figure out a way that it can be because our minds work so fast and we easily break the world all the time um, as visitors and participants to an experience that you want to ensure that you never give your audience member or visitor an opportunity to break out of your world. And so try the three second rule to uh, create an experience and a story that is truly immersive. So three seconds, that's almost like a couple blinks mm -hmm. of an eye. Yeah, yeah, that's how quickly you uh, absorb the environment that you're in. I mean, this is a survival skill, right? That we as human beings, like we know that we're in a safe place and a dangerous place is a fight and flight response, um, fight or flight. And so for us to quickly make sense of our environment and our surroundings, is something that we as humans evolved to do. So, you know, in three seconds or less, if you know where you are and you can quickly make sense of things, then you feel safe. And when you have that safety, then you're willing to play, then you're willing to engage. 
So you have to create that safety net first. Um, and that's something that is extremely important in world building. Because if you really want to take it back, what is it, Maslow's hierarchy yeah, of needs? Yeah, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, exactly. Yeah, so, so security, safety, I'm mm -hmm. not sure where they fall on that scale. Oh yeah, that's the most basic thing, right? That you feel um, safe, that your life isn't threatened. And then from there, you're able to enjoy the luxuries and the pleasures of life. So um, once you create that safety net of knowing that, you know, you're, and that's why like when you, we create any type of immersive experiences, we always start with um, the, uh, the world, the, uh, the rules or the um, rules of engagement. So, you know, you say things like, um, you know, please ensure that you, uh, you know, whatever it is, keep to the path, you know, don't touch this or whatever, so that you have that sense of safety before you enter the world. And that's one thing, right? To create those um, parameters, those uh, safety guardrails, if you will, the pool rules, the swim pool rules. And once you enter that experience, how do you create um, that next step of once you've established that safety, that you can enter a place and feel safe in those three seconds as well, you know? Um, and from there, you know, unless you have, you're building a horror house, which you, you don't want to feel safe, right? You want to be terrified and scared and running for your life. But in any other situation where you want people to play and engage, you have to ensure that they feel safe first and foremost um, to interact with others, to play, to engage, to discover, to explore. Can they open drawers? Um, but having that rule of the, the three second rule of looking around and quickly figuring out, okay, this is a, this is a place that I can quickly um, you know, in my mind, know that I'm in a, in this world, I'm immersed in it, I'm safe to do the things that I'm supposed to do is a really great way for you to win your audience uh, immediately when they start the experience. In your book, Immersive Storytelling, I think it was further in, page 186 or so, you say, as humans, we need to have idle time and occasionally be bored mm. and unproductive. Yes. And I love hearing that because I think a lot of times as creative people, we feel like, I'm not inspired today. Yeah. There must be something wrong. Like, why, why can't I do something creative? Yeah. I believe in being bored and unproductive wholeheartedly. I think that, you know, when we really think back to, um, you know, at least for me in my time being a kid and not, and feeling that boredom and not having anything to do. Um, that's really when I, you know, pulled out the blank sheet of paper, when I took my, the felt and my scissors and glue and started creating things and making things, um, and really trying to going, learning about that creative process. And whether it was good or bad, it didn't matter. I just wanted to create. And as you get older, you start, you know, editing yourself and like judging yourself before you even create the thing. And then you quit or you stop because it's not great. Or, you know, you think that someone else does it better, or all, you know, all these things. But I think that being bored and unproductive um, is a great way to quiet your mind and to reset and to shut out all the other voices that's telling you what you should be doing, what you should be creating. And when you're bored and unproductive, you'll be surprised to hear, you know, your inner voice, your inner artist about, uh, and your inner creative about what's meaningful to you. You know, when you stop hearing other people's opinions and um, perspective on what you should be doing in your, in your life or what project you should be working on next and all this. And I think that um, during the pandemic and when we were isolating and in our homes, that was something that I experienced in, you know, very um, uh, in, an, in an extreme form, like all of us that we are locked into our houses, we couldn't do anything about it, we were bored out of, our mind, out of our minds, and we wanted to do something again. And for me personally, it felt like I needed to had, have that reset button to realize what is important to me, what's still important to me, what's no longer important to me, right? And being bored and unproductive 
helps you to really um, have that open space in your mind to accept what comes in. And you'll be surprised, you know, you'll be surprised by what does enter your mind and your imagination when you're not constantly inundated with noise and chatter and uh, distractions. And so uh, I recommend everyone be bored and unproductive at least one day out of the week. <laughs> I think that's a problem for some people because uh, overscheduling is its own form of addiction. Yeah. And so I think they feel like I'm not being good if I don't have like all these things that I have lined up. Yeah. Like there's something wrong with me. Oh, yeah. And it's a constant struggle for me too, you know, because especially, uh, you know, living in L.A. is also, I remember when I first moved to L.A., people are like, you know, rushing from one thing to the next. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't have that much to do. You know, I actually have time to sit around here for two hours and have lunch. But people were rushing from one thing to the next. And it affected me, you know, over the years. I'm like, oh, I have to be busy too. I have to be productive. I have to work on five to six projects at a time like everyone else. Because that way, um, that's how I would want the world to perceive me as a very productive, creative, or, or, you know, writer or artist. And after a while, I realized, well... Who am I doing this for? And, you know, if if it is to please others, then that is definitely not my priority um, because life is short and we need to do the, the things that we ultimately are meant to do in this world and in this lifetime. So being bored and unproductive once in a while, I'm not saying all the time, right? Because we all need to, you know, do our things to earn money and, you know, whatever it is we do. Um, but it's it's a really great reminder, at least, to know that you don't always have to be productive as a human being, as an individual, that you need time to rest, you need time to uh, fill your well, because that's something that, you know, as a creative, I just need to walk around. You know, I need to take a hike, I need to do my yoga, I need to maybe walk around in a museum without any goals at all and wander and get lost and not have a destination and maybe let someone else plan something for me for a while, you know, um, and just let go of all of those expectations just for a while, you know, to have your mind refresh itself and to really, um, you know, think about what's, um, you know, what the most important things to you will surprisingly come to mind. Um, because, you know, oftentimes I think we clutter our minds and our lives. And some people do that, in, you know, and manifest in actual things, like when they, when people start cluttering their houses and things like that, right? Um, it's the same thing with our mind. And the more you let in, the more you perhaps start to lose what makes you, you. And there's never going to be another you in this lifetime or in this, you know, in, in the history of humankind. So uh, why not? Why not just, you know, let yourself um, be unproductive, not do anything so that you can listen to your inner voice to tell you what it is that you need to do or not do. I think it's a really great way to gain perspective on your life and it's something that you need to occasionally do in your life.